newspapers. The Sunday Herald's been a bit more open to the possibility of independence. But I wasn't, again, I was just not surprised by the, the findings of the, the report. Callan? One of the interesting things about the BBC is that I think the people within it know most profoundly how biased it is. And they kind of justify it on the lines of it being the state broadcaster, don't they? I mean, the, and there is a kind of basic intuitive argument that the state broadcaster is obviously going to speak up to the state. And they seem never to have quite cracked the idea of impartiality. How can you quite be impartial to the, the state sponsor of broadcasting? I mean, some will laugh at that and dismiss that and say, oh, these people are perfectly professional enough to be equal, even handed. Um, but I think it's one of these things that we all understand is, is bound to be the case. They're just bound to be biased. And in some ways, interestingly, it's the newspapers, it's the print media that aren't sponsored by the state that have uh, started off much more biased and are now becoming much more even-handed. The likes of the record, there's a notable change, and even the Sun, in terms of putting the case forward and and taking on board some of the arguments for independence. Hmm. Amy. Well, I think, like you said at the beginning, nobody's particularly surprised that the report found the BBC to be biased, and I think the media will be biased throughout the rest of the referendum campaign. And there's not a lot we can do about that apart from have better lines for the space of time we're given to speak, um, and to engage in other forms of communication and just be better on the doorsteps and better on the streets. And I think that's probably the only way we're going to win because the media will be biased. We've already seen that it will be. And I don't think anything is going to change. I think another thing um, to do with just the nature of, of the media today is that it is so incredibly cynical about politics. And it has reason to be incredibly cynical about politics. And when it gets politicians from you know the SNP and, and so on talking about independence as kind of hope and change and uh, I can't remember who talk, who described Obama's campaign as hopey, hopey, change, change, but that's something that's going on in Scotland as well, you can see. And when they're being given this message, which is about kind of, you know, a, a better nation and so on, they are very cynical about it. And it's it's just something that's been ingrained in the media for decades. And so it's always going to be the kind of negative, slightly more um, pessimistic side of the campaign that's, or side of the debate that's going to get a bit more sympathy in the media. Um, is that on the account of the, the kind of media principle of uh, if it bleeds, it leads? If the story's bloody, it gets more uh, readers, listeners, whatever? Yeah, to an extent. But it, I think it's there's also a, just a kind of philosophical side to it where journalists are sceptical about politicians promising better things, that things are going to be better. Um, and they're, they're much less likely to question people who say things aren't going to be better. So the No Campaign do have a sort of ingrained advantage with the media in that sense. Hmm. Another thing that's interesting on this media bias thing is, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but they've it's recently started up the whole thing about cybernats, vicious cybernats. Um, and it, the whole construction of the cybernat is a, is a strange thing. James Maxwell on the podcast said, a cybernat is any supporter of independence within 15 feet of a computer, which seems actually to be a fair definition. You know, there's a lot of nonsense talked about you know, the abuse and, okay, people say stupid things, but you can go in 10 seconds and find, uh, you know, people saying they want to kill Alex Salmond and things like that, and much, much more vitriolic stuff on the unionist side, but that never makes the newspapers. Um, I just wonder what what you made of all this uh, cybernet stuff, Callan. Well, the the impression I get is that the no, um, some of the no media, especially the Daily Mail, have sort of spurted this concept back into the, the airwaves and the discussion. And I think what we now have to do is grapple with that concept. And that's where I don't agree with you. I don't think we should let Cybernat just designate anybody on the internet who's making a case for independence. What needs to happen is everybody who is sane, everybody who isn't infected with this kind of nasty nationalism that a lot of us can identify, need to say, well, we are not them. They are an infective, they are a damaging sort of sect that do roam around these sites and cause havoc and they do nobody any good. So, I mean, I think we now have to engage in a kind of battle with the likes of the male saying we accept the concept, but we don't accept that it's us. We accept that they're as bad as, as, as you say they are. And I think that's the way we get out of this discussion. We don't say, ah, let's all take it on our backs that we are in one way or another cybernats because that will lead us nowhere. That will just fuel the enemy. So um, we all need to turn against them. Yes and no. That's, that's, my, that's my feeling. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with Callan there. I think um, the other thing to worry about is that, you know, this is a very active group of people on the internet. It might be a very small group of people on the internet, but it's a very active group of people on the internet. 
and um you know a lot of them just have really terrible politics i mean i, I remember one of them complaining to me about something i'd written a while ago and saying oh i'm not left or right i'm i'm just scottish and i'm a nationalist and i said well that's borderline fascism right there i mean it's so i mean there's there's definitely an element in here which which is is quite scary and i don't think it should be shunted off into the long grass by the yes campaign i think we should just say well these people shouldn't really be part of this campaign we shouldn't be pretending they don't exist we should be condemning their views and condemning their methods at the risk of a cliche i mean isn't it you know you can find a few idiots wherever you go if you go to the park a few of the people there will be idiots if you go to the pub a few of the people there will be idiots. in any kind of country or movement there's there's bound to be a few but I, I don't know. My, my my opinion is that the, the whole the whole idea of it is massively overblown for political reasons from a media that generally supports the unions. I, I I'm sure that a few of these kind of vicious cybernets exist, but some of the quotes that they give to say vicious cybernets is you know he's an arsehole, you know vicious attack. And it's not. I mean, calm down. I mean, I don't think the media should really be focusing on what's happening on the internet at all because. The internet is a place where anyone can speak and be heard. And so there's absolutely no reason for the media to go fishing around for things on there. It's just as if they're doing random opinion polls or something. So there's no there's no real need for the media to be talking about that kind of thing. So clearly the fact that it has been blown up in the media is a bad thing because they're trying to give the impression that that's the majority of the Yes campaign. But at the same time, it's not as if it doesn't actually exist in real life. It's also interesting that it's so long it's been a tactic. I mean, if you look at Better Together, they say this is a campaign for all of Scotland. And they say, and we all know that on the, the yes side, there are fanatical campaigners. Um, and so they, this whole idea of trying to picture and create this idea of the yes side all being slightly loony, slightly fanatical, um, slightly out of touch characters needs always to be countered by a kind of sober realism. Um, and some of that does mean getting on the same side as, as the people criticising the cybernet and saying, yeah, they are loonies. But one of the other nice things that, that will come if we get the yes vote is a kind of resolution of this old nationalist debate. You know, it will be over. It will be glorious. These people won't have anything to say. They'll just roam around in kind of nationalist sort of glorifying Scotland circles that don't really get much resonance. So there is a spotlight on them at the moment, given that it's a debate about independence. But Hopefully the light will move somewhere else after a yes vote. But it's interesting to note that sometimes the unionist side don't tend to need cybernats. I found a list the other day. OK, we can all um, talk about Alex Salmond and you've made it quite clear that you're not particular fans of him. And um, I've never voted uh, SNP either in my life. I've always voted for an independent supporting party, but not necessarily them. I'm not a member of any party, anything. However, like you'll find that I, I published a list yesterday uh, where th- um, actual Labour politicians uh, or unionist politicians doing the vitriolic stuff, you know, uh, he's been compared to Mugabe twice. Well, who else was it? It was Stalin once, Robespierre once, <laughs> also um, Hitler several times. I mean, do you not think uh, that in some ways it's the unionist politicians and main campaigners that provide the over-the-top stuff from, from them? Well, at the same time, as you've criticised earlier, uh, the, the Yes Scotland side are, are, are too sort of moderate. Yeah, I think to some extent it's true that the other side have come out with this bile as well. But uh, honestly, I don't think it will get through. There will be a core set of um, unionist nationalists, if you like, people who are pretty committed to that side. I mean, I know some of them in the Labour Party. Incidentally, most of the people in my constituency, Labour Party, aren't anything like that at all. But there are a few. They just and to ridicule themselves. And I think the issue that hasn't really worked at all for the better together side is this kind of nasty language. It's a bit like the backfiring claim by Theresa May that that the Tories were the nasty party. They've tarred themselves. Yeah, and and, you know, the voters can hear cybernat so many times, but all that the S campaign needs to do is say that we'll better together are full of Tories. And most Scottish voters know what Tory is much more than they know what a cybernet is. And they hate Tories much more than they hate cybernet. So I think in general, you know, yes, Scotland still has a bit of an advantage when it comes to who they associate with. To move on to another topic, uh, something that, again, is one of these canards that constantly comes up, brought up every two minutes, which is the idea of if independence comes, there's going to be border controls at Gretna. I don't know who's most worried about this because I I can't really see it happening. I don't see any reason why it should. I'll go to Callan first there. 
Well, it's absolutely not going to happen as long as there are pretty similar rules for immigration. And by pretty similar, I mean quite different, but not totally divergent on the same basis as, as the European Union and the Schengen Agreement. I mean, you don't even need to be in the EU. Norway and, fin- uh, Norway and Sweden don't have great border posts between them either. So it's ludicrous. The only circumstance in which there would be borders would be if Scottish and English immigration policy diverged so radically that there was a complete difference in terms of movement of labour and movement of people. And the signs are that the only circumstance that would happen would be if England, under the auspices of a kind of UKIP government, uh, shunted to the right. So the threat really is, and the, the point that it brings home is, that the only circumstance in which we'd have these sort of borders would be a very good reason to leave the UK. So I, I think the argument just needs to be ridicule the idea of borders, but put in the warning that, yeah, we don't know what's going to happen with Britain if they really do take us down a nasty path then we don't want to be in the inside. Amy? I mean, it doesn't seem unlikely to me that UKIP become popular in England if Scotland leaves. And I suppose in that case, borders um, between Scotland and England could be a useful populist policy if people really become fired up by this sort of thing. It doesn't seem like the most unlikely thing ever to me, but I think it would be many years down the line and it would be in... It would be if England had been taking a very wrong political path and the left in England had no grasp at all on trying to win popular opinion round to a better immigration policy. And Rory, do you think that um, this could happen, That you know, the, the different immigration policies? Because it's been mentioned quite a few times that there's a lot of room in Scotland and with the pop- ageing population, although the difference between Scotland and England... Scotland is only slightly worse in terms of its population age demographic than than England is. But do you think that that this could actually lead to a problem? It could be interesting here that if Scotland's asking for immigration and England's rejecting it. Well, um, I like to think that England's not going to shift particularly far to the right, particularly further to the right than it already is. I don't think that England is is absolutely full of racists and Scotland isn't. I would say that... um, kind of very right wing parties have much more obviously have much more of a foot, foothold in England than they do in Scotland. But I don't think it's particularly realistic to think that our immigration policies are going to diverge any more radically than between countries that already have open borders between each other. And I think it would be a very, very right wing party that would do it in England. And I don't think they're going to get elected. Specifically on uh, immigration policy, did you did any of you recently read uh, Hamza Youssef in the paper saying that uh, in an independent Scotland they're going to closed Dungavel. I'm sure that you'd think that's a, something to be welcomed at least. Absolutely something, yeah, absolutely something to be welcomed. I mean, it, it's also a cross-party thing, isn't it? Because back when Labour were in power, it was one of the big illustrations of the way they were kind of being guided by London when Jack McConnell phoned up Tony Blair to ask whether they could sort of start closing down Dungavel and in particular stop child detention. Tony Blair said, no, go away, stop causing us bother. So it was to save embarrassment of the National British Labour Party, that the Labour Party in Scotland weren't able to carry out the, the obvious humane policy of, of changing Dungable. So, I, I mean, it's a cross-party issue. Humza Yousaf, I think, to some extent, wants to try and take some of the credit for this, but it's been an issue for, for so long. It just illustrates why we need the powers. It's as simple as that. I noticed as well, Yousaf made a broader claim about having a kind of do-no-harm foreign policy. And I, I appreciate that up to a point, but I think there are risks. I mean, th- this is something we're really going to have to think about after independence and obviously beforehand is that, you know, we can't just try and say, oh, all of these things that are bad that are happening in the world are not in our name. The fact that workers are being treated horribly and manufacture of goods that Scotland might profit from, you know, and, and the SNP have made it clear, as have, in fact, the Commonweal, that they're going to try and stick us on a particular rung of the global economy that's going to advantage us both socially and, and economically. And that's nonetheless going to be part of a, a particularly exploitative global economy. So in, while I appreciate do no harm as a principle for foreign policy, I think we also have to think about how Scotland, and not necessarily Scotland as some kind of homogenous nationalist whole, but how uh, progressive movements within Scotland can remain engaged um, with wider global struggles without becoming smug about our own advantages. And I worry, actually, that uh, particularly the kind of Nordic approach risks that. Um, which is, again, one of the reasons we are so keen to move away from it. 
I think Rory's right that it's it's been under discussed um, issues of foreign policy and Scotland's place in the world, and of course that's. Because 